<clears throat> so welcome everyone then we have been continuing uh, the way of the bodhisattva or walking on the bodhisattva path and for those of us who are new to this uh, basically it's just walking uh, with a lot of goodwill you know and awakening the inner heart and mind uh, in simple words it's just in mother's words it's awakening the psychic being working from the psychic being or for those of us who may not be aware of the word psychic being it's basically working from our innate goodness so we are again and again trying to disidentify from our ill wills and surface consciousness and to awaken and to give chance for the goodness in us to operate generosity kindness and us to operate and that's the path of bodhisattva who would keep himself aside but would work for the benefit of others and this in front of you is uh, the vows uh, of bodhisattva by shanti deva a very old uh, like olden time teachers and this uh, vow is being taken by the lai lama his holiness the lai lama every morning he gets up and he reads the vows for himself so we have just made it a kind of a tradition for us uh, so that it's good to remind basically because we forget you know from time to time our attention too much goes to my problems my issues so if we read these lines again and again it serves as a good reminder basically for all of us so anyone who feels ready if uh, you could slowly just read these lines for all of us that would be nice Uh, Ravi ji, you are muted. Uh, please unmute first. Yeah, thank you. May I be a May I be a guard for those who need protection, a guide for those on the path, a boat, a raft, a bridge for those who wish to cross the flood. May I be a lamp in the darkness, a resting place for the weary, a healing medicine for all who are sick, a vase of plenty, a tree of miracles. and for the boundless multitudes of living beings may i bring sustenance and awakening enduring like the earth and sky until all beings are freed from sorrow and all are awakened thank you ravi ji so now i'm going to share what we are reflecting upon nowadays so this is what we are doing i hope all of us can see this <clears throat> so it's uh, these root verses by atisha again a buddhist teacher and tenzing palmo jatsunma tenzing palmo is elaborating upon these verses and we are Uh, listening to her teachings and then sharing our reflections and questions if any so just like always i would request if uh, one by one i think we can distribute like it would be nice if each one can have a few lines to read so if one of you could read these lines that i have highlighted and then the other one and then the other one yeah anyone who feels like reading it for all of us would be really nice can i start yeah please the supreme understanding is to realize the meaning of selflessness the supreme spiritual discipline is to tame one's own mind the supreme great quality is altruism the supreme oral instruction is to observe the mind at all times the supreme remedy is to know that nothing has self nature thank you ashwini so maybe the next one one of you can read these lines yeah anyone who feels ready uh, snehi or taru whoever wants to read 
a supreme conduct is to be in this harmony with the world supreme conduct is to be in this harmony with the world supreme accomplishment is a continuous decrease of disturbing emotions the supreme sign of accomplishment is a continuous decrease of wishes and want the supreme generosity is non attachment the supreme ethical conduct is to pacify one's mind yeah thank you so i think ye uh, disharmony wala jo hai it would be interesting actually to uh, when we come here i think you were uh, yeah i think we'll be thinking about whether it's the right word or not yeah yeah i first i thought <laughs> that it's actually it's a misprint but then i understood yeah what this harmony there yes. yeah thank you <laughs> yeah snehi would you like to read do you have the capacity to read yeah okay the supreme ethical conduct is to pacify one's mind the supreme patience is to take the next place the supreme effort is letting go of anxiety the supreme concentration is not altering the mind the supreme is to not grasp on to anything as the self yeah thank you <clears throat> and maybe these uh, ravi ji you can go through these the last ones the supreme spiritual teacher is the one who exposes our hidden flaws and the supreme instruction is the one that helps us to strike at those flaws the supreme companions are mindfulness and alertness the supreme inspiration is enemies hindrances disease and suffering the supreme method is to be natural the supreme way of benefiting is to help others enter the dharma the supreme benefit is a mind that turns towards the dharma beautiful thank you so much everyone thank you for reading out all these so we were continuing with the first one just uh, put it up again so tenzing palmo jit sunma tenzing palmo was reflecting upon uh, supreme understanding is to realize the meaning of selflessness this was being talked about so we will just continue with the last threads of these and then we will come uh, in today's session itself i am hoping that we will start with this the supreme spiritual discipline is to tame one's own mind so i'm going to put up the teaching we are going to listen to it for some time from the, the buddhist perspective the whole problem of our suffering is because we identify ourselves with all the things which we are not and and because of this ignorance this unknowing of our true nature we miss out and and we we suffer we identify ourselves we think this is me our bodies Our, our our mind, our ordinary conceptual mind, our our thinking mind. We we identify with our gender, with our race, with our nationality, with our families, with our memories, with our beliefs, and we think this is who I am. but from a buddhist perspective this is exactly who we are not yes it is a temporary role which we are playing and of course we should try to play that role as well as we can but 
understanding it is just a temporary role. If we met ourselves in our past lives, we would not recognize ourselves. If we met ourselves in our future lifetimes, who is that? That's not me. The Buddha said, if we look for ourself, however much, and, and a large part of Buddhist meditation is searching for the self. This idea of I, which sits like a kind of spider in the midst of the web. If we really look for it, it's like peeling an onion. You take off layer after layer after layer, but where is it? And so this, this, this quality of, of understanding that our, the person that we normally identify with is, is like the waves. They were saying that yesterday, somebody was saying that, and it's so true. It's like the waves on the t surface of the ocean, but it's only a part of the ocean. It's not the whole ocean. I mean, the, the waves, yes, that's what we see. The waves come, the waves go, but that is not who we really are. Who we really are is something, it's a tragedy because who we really are, as all religions are trying to show, point out to us, is something so much vaster than that. Our self, our sense of self depends on our dualistic conceptual mind. Me versus others, everyone else, not me. And so this subject-object dichotomy is the very basis of our ignorance, that we don't recognize our true nature. It's not, when the Buddha said there, there is no I, he didn't mean we don't exist. I mean, that's absurd. Of course we exist. But we exist as in our, our true nature. It's something so much incredibly vaster and more beautiful than we can imagine. And all genuine spiritual paths understand that. I mean, whatever you want to call it, you can call it the God within, the divine, Buddha nature, anything. It's, it's, that's just a name for something which goes beyond name. And again, that, as they, um, has been pointed out, that in the Orthodox Church, uh, God is never named because it's beyond thought. It's beyond concepts. Anything we say about it, it's not that. And so we can't speak about it, really, but we can realize it because it's our true nature. It's not, it sounds like something very far, very distant, like looking when you're on the plains at the Himalayan mountains. But actually, it's so close that they say it's like the eye, the eyes, you know, cannot see the eyelashes because they're too close. Our innate, primordial, unborn awareness is like the sky. The sky is up there, vast and blue. It gets covered by clouds. There are also rainbows. There are also lightning and thunder. But there could not be any clouds or rainbows if there was not the sky. I'm just going to take a pause here. We'll listen to the rest of the teaching too. So just take this moment because she just shared that our true nature is as close to us as the eyelashes to the eye. So let us just for two minutes close our eyes. And look at this knowing quality in you. There is a knowing in you which knows your thoughts. you know what thought I am thinking, right? There is a knowing quality in you by which 
you know what I am feeling. This knowing is always there. So I am speaking and you know what I am speaking, right? You know what is going on in your head. You know what is going on in your body. You know what is going on at the feeling level. How are you feeling right now? So there is a knowing behind the thoughts, feelings and bodily sensations. And it is always there, just like uh, she was sharing the example of sky. Without the sky, clouds can't be. And clouds are the thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations. And the knowing exists irrespective of the clouds. Just like the sky exists irrespective of the clouds. So just wanted to share that it is so intimate of a true nature and this is what we have to identify with. I am the knowing. So whenever a thought or feeling or emotion becomes overwhelming, you know, you can, we can actually practice not only when it's overwhelming, but in day to day times. Yeah. Beautiful. Yes, Nehi. Yes. It is beautiful. Yes. No doubt. And even Kabir ji and other masters have said that our true nature is so close to us that we ignore it. Because when something is far, we can see. But this is so close that we take it for granted. And that's what we are awakening to. We are awakening to our true nature. We are not getting our true nature from somewhere else. It is right here with me 24-7 because of which I act and do and whatever. But I don't know that that is who I am. So that's the awakening that needs to happen with each one of us. So just wanted to point out uh, to that. We'll continue. The sky is everywhere. The sky is all pervading. You cannot catch the sky and say, this is my piece of sky. And so in that way, you cannot say when one is in a state of, of primordial awareness, this is my awareness. It's just awareness. And so it's also called waking up. We're dreaming the dream of ignorance. We need to. So I think this is also very important. When whenever we talk about enlightenment, uh, we cannot say that I am enlightened. <laughs> you know, we can't say that. Why? Because uh, just like she shared, so. Imagine that there is just this sky, vast sky of consciousness. Hmm? And each one of us is trapped in this surface kind of a cloud, right? The moment the cloud goes away, I realize, oh my God, I was always the sky. But I cannot say that the sky is mine. You know, it's, it, it's nothing that I can possess. Now the same uh, place, the same area, Another cloud may realize that, oh my God, I am the sky. My true nature is sky. And the sky is the same. You know? So it's not in parts and pieces. And that's why we say that we cannot do it all by ourselves. If one awakens, his responsibility is to awaken others. And that's why people, masters and mystics, uh, put so much effort in going around and spreading this word at the stake of their own practice. So this is like a sky and we are all awakening that I am the sky, I am the sky, I am the sky, I am the sky. So the sky doesn't belong to anyone and that's why the enlightened nature doesn't belong to anyone. To wake up. It's like when you're sleeping, while we're sleeping, we, we really believe our dreams. I mean, the body also believes the dreams. But when we wake up, we, we are in a completely different level of consciousness. 
And likewise, from an enlightened point of view, our ordinary everyday consciousness is, is like being asleep. So the whole of the spiritual path is really a process of wakening, wakening up. And sometimes we wake up and then we fall back to sleep. But it's important because even though we fall back to sleep, we have that memory that, you know, of the awakened state, even if it only lasts for a, a finger snap. It's very important that we actually believe that we are divine. Not just because we've read it or because our gurus told us or because it's a nice idea, but because we ourselves have actually experienced that that is true. That's like getting a real foothold on the path. Because one has the confidence then, the faith based on our own experience, that this is true. This is the truth. We are not who we think we are. And neither is anyone else. So we'll take a pause here. This uh, would end, almost end the uh, first uh, verse that we were reading, the supreme uh, understanding is to realize the meaning of selflessness. That's what we were reflecting upon. That we are not the self that we think we are. And that's where it's becoming important for us to realize that there is no ego self out there. Yes. What I think myself to be is just my imagination. So anything anyone wants to share at this moment? Any reflections? One thing she said, uh, <clears throat> Monica, <coughs> uh, she mentioned uh, which it's really something that I hold on to is not really just my uh, mental understanding of um, the selflessness, but truly gathering from the experiences that we have, whatever they might be, in whatever form, in, you know, in dream state or during meditation or whatever, even if it lasts for just a little bit. And then, uh, I don't know, something happens, I get lost in... Uh, it's just just life but but it's there and somehow in a matter of time it's always going back back to that and going a little bit little bit more a little bit different but i that's the one thing that i hold on to that um keeps me away from i don't know helps me to battle doubts because it is something that i cannot question my experience it is something that i it is very concrete That's beautiful. I think mother also talks about this, <clears throat> where she says that uh, even if once and all of us at least once have been given a glimpse, you know, we all have maybe more than once. So mother says that if it has happened only once with you, as you said, hold on to that experience and revive it, relive it again and again, and make that your reality. Right. Know, know that if it can happen once, it can also happen again and again and again, and it can become your life. Mother also says that, yeah. yeah. So thank you for sharing this. Mm. Yes, thank you. Yeah, very true. <laughs> yeah, Taru, you want to share? Yeah, on the same lines, you know, once I had read something from the mother and our sadhak had asked the question that how do I always stay with that experience? You know, like mother with grace, you had, you know, given me some vision or, you know, I mean, what we were talking about. 
so she was like that keep thinking about how do you move away from it right like i know we have heard it before for different contexts but even for these experiences which have told us that you know i am more than who meets the eye so she said that question why do i you know why do i doubt why do i go away and then you will have a more continued you will be most you know situated there than where you run off to so yeah yeah okay so i will uh, just resume and just give me a moment i'll just put it the right at the right location the greater the the compassion they go together sorry i i need to know what time we're doing. so we are oh, really? moving to the Wonderful. we are moving to the next verse now verse 2 hey, i'm completely mindless <laughs> this this one line really sums up the whole of the buddhist path but we have 20 lines to go through although we have two days to do it in so it's it's not desperate okay so the supreme spiritual discipline is to tame one's own mind well, that's obvious. I mean, the, the whole problem. <laughs> <laughs> the whole problem is that our minds are so untamed. I mean, anyone who sits down to meditate, right? You all sit down nicely, sitting there all in samadhi. You get the point, right? <laughs> so, therefore, this, this word, uh, spiritual discipline, um, in Tibetan it's the word sunpa. And so someone else has translated it as nobility. This word sun um, means something disciplined, fine, pure, noble, um, it has a very nice sound in, in Tibetan. It, um, so uh, it's also the word for uh, the polite word for a, a nun who is called a tsun ma, someone who is pure and disciplined and, and noble. So he's saying here that the supreme, the highest nobility or the supreme spiritual discipline is to tame one's own mind because that's the crux of the matter we live in our mind it's much more important what we think than what we eat sorry it doesn't matter how pure your food that's not going to get you to supreme bliss. <laughs> However pure your food, the important thing is how is pure is your mind. So it's like if we had a wild horse, if we saw a horse in the wild and we looked at that horse and we said, wow, that's a really good horse. That horse has great potential. But it's wild. I can't train it because it's wild. First, it has to be tamed. 
So then how to tame this wild horse? Well, we can beat it into submission. Uh, any of you who have been to India can see these poor donkeys who are very obedient, totally broken, tamed, miserable. And so we can do that with our mind. We can force our mind to become calm. We might even be able to, thought, to force our mind to become thoughtless, I'm not sure, but maybe we could. I mean, it will end up a very tense, subdued, tight mind, which is likely to break out at any moment. But sometimes people do that with their spiritual discipline. And they end up very frigid and rigid and tight, but disciplined. But the other way, as we all know, to tame the wild horse is to befriend it. To get the horse to trust us and be interested, maybe, in being trained. So we offer sugar, <laughs> we, we stroke it, we, we are kind to the horse, and then the horse begins to settle down and begins gradually to, to want to cooperate with being trained. And, and so this is also like the mind. We can beat the mind into submission. We can flagellate ourselves. But flagellation does not end with a happy, contented, peaceful mind. And so the way to deal with the mind is to get the mind relaxed and centered, peaceful and enthusiastic to be trained. We all know that if we are doing something which we enjoy, we don't need coercion. If we are reading a book which we enjoy what reading, or if you're watching some movie which is interesting, nobody has to force you. The mind goes there. And it, it just stays on the, the subject of which you are concentrating on, the book or the movie or whatever. Because the mind is interested. So therefore, it's very important for us to develop that quality of really being interested in what we're doing, really wanting to do it, enjoying it. Because when we enjoy something, we don't have to force ourselves. As we know. So, therefore, to tame the mind means to get the mind quiet and peaceful. And one-pointed. So that when we want to think about this, we can think about this. When we want to think about that, we can think about that. Now that state of mind, which is peaceful and focused and, and um, just very present, is a happy mind. And with that quiet, happy mind, we can work. What we are trying to do is to make the mind workable. The moment our minds are, are very obdurate, they, we want them to focus on this, so they will go there. We want to think up, it will go down. So just uh, again, taking a pause here. Any, if there are any reflections in what we have.
I think this is very, very true. What, uh, in our own experiences, we can see for those of us who have been working with bringing the mind to the breath, to the body in the present moment, I think they would realize that it really works. We, so, so that we can be self-motivated to practice. So that we can be interested in practice. And we don't have to force ourselves because it works you know you feel so simple so light uh, the burden of stories is not there and the life becomes really richer and fuller if we try to even try to tame the mind in the beginning we may see just how jumpy the mind is but this really works in no time that you are able to if you are convinced that this is the right way for me to go then it really, really helps. And any decision which is taken by a still mind, a quiet mind, a calm mind, would always be a better decision. So anything here, anyone? Yeah, Ashwini, you want to share something? I think when we when we stay conscious with bringing the mind back, as you said, to the breath or you know even with concentration or even doing any activity that um whatever it is in a, you know in a state of um, um attention and concentration it is the ideal way to keep the the mind happy um i think uh, that's an interesting word i think i think that is the best way to do it but but there are times in between that it does, it does tend to go away um, many times, many times. And um, sometimes even whether you want to or not, you know, even if you listen to a piece of music, it's very difficult to get the mind to quieten down after that. There are so many things we are exposed to that um, brings the physical mind uh, to the, you know, the, the front and it's very difficult to calm it. But I think really the thing that has personally um, helped me um, it is, it's, it's actually like, sometimes I don't even realize my physical mind is like turning around and around because, you know, I might be doing something, but in the background, something is circling, but if I pay attention and then I realize, oh my God, you know, all I have to do is sometimes I raise it up, uh, open it to the mother and, uh, it really, um, that, that really works. Or uh, practicing, um, you know, mindful breathing helps, but it is it is a constant, constant challenge. Yeah, absolutely, it's a constant challenge. Yeah, totally. And as you know, those of us who practice and have listened, also we had shared uh, Deepa Ma's teaching once in a while. I think in the morning meditation, where she was sharing. Uh, how to be mindful and how to practice mindfulness and she shared that when you are sitting for example in the sitting meditation if you are sitting or maybe focusing your attention to the rising and falling of the abdomen when the breath comes in breath goes out and you are quietening down the mind the mind will wander away so one doesn't have to be judgmental about it because it's just habituated to wander away it's a child who has not been trained so habituated to wander away so what she said was very beautiful that if the mind wanders away just look at it gone away gone away say these words to yourself inwardly okay gone away gone away that you have seen that it has started to go away and then you again bring it back to the rising and falling of the tummy rising and falling of the tummy so we can keep it very simple because it's all of us in are in the same boat together we all have same minds and uh, those of us who have practiced much may have much uh, quieter minds but most of us are in the same boat and mind will wander away 
how long will we keep judging it you know so not to drain energy in judgment at all the moment it gets away gone away gone away and then bringing back your attention to the breath so that's what she had suggested deepama yeah. thank you yeah so there was uh, something very beautiful that i was listening and since it is related i thought i'll just play a short clip of it today itself is there any reflection before that before i play the next one So in absence uh, of any further reflection, I'll just share this last teaching that I want to share uh, today, since it was just correlating with what uh, we were discussing. So this is uh, by Sharon Salzberg. You can find about her online. And I found like it's, it's a nice talk, very short clip. Uh, we'll not listen to the whole thing, just an audio clip. Then maybe two hours later, you go, whoops. I guess I said that uh, it's not a small thing to know what you're thinking and feeling as you're thinking or feeling it, rather than having kind of irritation, leading to anger, and not even realizing that's what you're feeling. And you go off to the computer, and you type out that email and you press send. Then maybe two hours later you go, whoops. I guess I said that with some hostility, didn't I? And in uh, the old days of email, which is a very funny thing to be able to say, um, I know if you, had a, if you were using a platform like AOL, and the recipient of your nasty, hostile email was also on AOL. There was a magic button you could press on your computer called unsend. And it was like something in your computer reached out to theirs and just pulled it back as though it never was. I once unsent an email to a friend wasn't all that nasty, but I thought better of it. And she wrote to me right away and she said, the weirdest thing just happened. <laughs> I was looking at my screen and there was an email from you and then it just disappeared. <laughs> and I wrote back to her and I said, isn't that strange? <laughs> Who understands these things, anyway, right? But life doesn't give us that many unsend buttons. So it's not a small thing to know we're feeling angry, to be able to recognize that before we've acted and maybe done something very consequential. A definition of mindfulness I've used a lot came from, kind of along these lines, came from an article in the New York Times I read many years ago it was about one of those mindfulness in schools programs, like a very early one. And this was about a fourth grade classroom in California, which was doing this pilot project on using some tools of mindfulness. And I thought it was a, a really good article. I especially liked two quotations in it. One was from one of the researchers who said, all day long we tell kids to pay attention, but we never teach them how. And then they asked one of the kids, so this is fourth grade, that means he's like nine or 10 years old. They said to him, what is mindfulness? What is mindfulness? And he replied, mindfulness means not hitting someone in the mouth. That's what mindfulness is. And I thought, great definition. 
I think that is a great, great definition. Because what does it imply? It implies knowing you're feeling angry as you start to feel angry. It also implies a certain balanced relationship to that anger. If you just fall into it and get overwhelmed by it, we'd probably hit a lot of people in the mouth, right? Life can be really frustrating. But at the same time, if you hate it, you fear it, you can't stand that you got angry and you get tighter and tighter and tighter, then you explode, right? So mindfulness means not hitting someone in the mouth, which implies you're aware quickly of what you're feeling. You have a certain balanced relationship. You can recognize this is anger. Maybe you can look deeply into the anger. It creates a certain sense of space. And in that space, we see options. It doesn't mean you're judging what you're feeling. It means you have the space and time to not just act from it kind of automatically. So maybe in that space, you think, you know, hit someone in the mouth last week. Didn't work out that well. <laughs> maybe I'll try this. Maybe I'll write that email and not press send right away. Or something that, in doing the research for my book, Real Happiness at Work, something someone suggested to me was, if you sense that email might be very provocative, then send it to yourself first and get to read it as the recipient. What does it feel like to get an email like that? You know, then decide. Mindfulness will create the kind of space that we need to feel many options in terms of how we might act or, or react or respond. Okay, so we're going to sit Yeah, so any last reflections? Anyway? So I think uh, it was Tignathan who said that uh, it's like, <clears throat> yeah, just like uh, Sharon Silsberg was sharing that the anger is arising anger is arising and a part of you is with the breath in the present moment in mindful of the anger arising and this parallel energy of mindfulness this is a very powerful vibration that's what he was sharing and i think it really really works very well so the anger is arising anger is arising and something in me is mindful there is a consciousness in me which is conscious of the anger arising and if we stay mindful, there gets generated this energy of mindfulness, which kind of a, like a mother cradles the baby. You know, this energy of mindfulness has the power to dissolve the vib lower vibration of anger. So both things, we have to see that both things can happen and will happen at the same time. It's not that when I'm mindful, then I'm not angry. I am mindful of the anger arising. And then I have, as uh, she was sharing, that then there is a breathing space in which I can choose now not to follow the dictate of the anger. And this is how we step back, in mother's words, this is how we step back from the surface consciousness and go towards our deeper nature, true nature. Just wanted to put that. Yeah, thank you, Snehi. Thank you. So Snehi has uh, shared a link uh, for those of us who are interested. Please copy this and uh, use it to listen to it. Mindful breathing and walking. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, anyone? Any? We have uh, last few minutes left. We will retire for the day. Yeah, yes. just something very small. You know, it's mm -hmm. like when we are talking about these things that one is mindful, one sees. And when one is able to stop oneself from doing something that you usually had indulged in the past or had reacted, it, it, it there is a joy in it. 
like just wanted to just you know share that that it's like it feels that yes it feels very light it feels that yes you know like oh that's also doable oh i you know so yeah it's really nice to be able to not give in yeah that's it thank yeah, you yeah beautiful yes yeah there is a joy you know mother also shares uh, i think one line that i remember from her she shares stepping back from desire gives you joy you know because we think that if i fulfill my desire then i will get pleasure of some sorts you know usually that happens but when we are able to see the desire arising and we are able to let go of that step back from that what taru was sharing that not follow the dictate that really gives us a lot of joy yeah one has to just experiment with one thing <laughs> okay so in case of no further reflection thank you everyone thank you for joining in we will have continuation of these reflections every thursday same time 9 pm and uh, it's a long long like it's too many talks so we'll explore it all together for those of us interested and thank you for listening and thank joining you. Thank, thank you very much thank you bye 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 thank, thank you so much thank you bye bye bye